I'm Olga Mayorova, director of the Center for, Rus uh, for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our symposium, Ann Arbor in Russian Literature, revisiting the Karl Proffer and artist legacies. We open today with the workshop, Artist Publishers and the Russian Literary Canon. The participants will reflect on the unique role artists played in preserving and publishing Russian literature that was banned or neglected during the Soviet period. Uh, they will talk about the contribution artists made to the formation of the Russian literary canon, both for Russians and for non-Russian speakers in the Anglophone wo world. And they will discuss how artist publications played a significant role in the rediscovery of Russian literature in Russia, a process that began in the final Soviet years and continued into the post-Soviet period. Before our workshop starts, I would like to thank the people who made it possible. First of all, uh, it's my pleasure to thank Alindea Teasley Proffer for her enthusiastic support of our efforts. We organized the symposium in content, in constant consultations with Alindea, and we are grateful for her continuous support. I also want to thank the staff at Chris and the Weiser Center for their assistance in planning and organizing the symposium. We are here today because of the hard and creative work done by our st staff members, Marisha Astafin, Donna Parmeli, Nicole Hausen, and Gita Kilo. All of them are here. I also want to express my gratitude to Janet Crane and Kathleen Dow for curating the exhibit of items from the artist ar archive that will be on display at the Clark Library inside the Hatcher Graduate Library on Saturday from 10.30 uh, to 12.30. And I'm delighted to acknowledge the main sponsors and institutional organizers of the symposium. The Center for Russian and East European and Eurasian Studies, uh, the Wise Center for Emerging Democracies, and the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, as well as the support provided by a wide range of other university units listed at the end of the program. And now it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Michael Makin, Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures, who will moderate the workshop and introduce the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to this workshop devoted to one of the most important phenomena in the history of Russian literature in the late 20th century, as one author quite right, rightly remarked, the 70s and early 80s could really quite justifiably be called the artist period of Russian literature. Um, first of all, I have a very, very practical announcement. I've been asked to remind you all, perhaps to alert many of you, to the fact that almost all the microphones in this room are live, and this event is being broadcast live no three-second delay for us, I'm afraid, folks, uh, to the World Wide Web. So those of you who communicate within the auditorium, um, anything above a whisper will likely to have whatever you're saying broadcast to the world. So do bear this in mind, please, especially in the Slavic world. We know how interesting that can be. Um, thank you, Olga, for your words of welcome. Again, welcome, everyone. Uh, the Biographies of our distinguished speakers are to be found in the brochure for this symposium, and I do not propose to spend what little time we have on, length, on lengthy introductions. Um, all I can say is that for all of us, all of us of a certain age at least, the subject of today's discussion is incredibly important, intensely important. I remember so well my own first discoveries of artist books as an undergraduate in university libraries and in bookstores, uh, and that was the beginning of an incredibly important 
path of discovery for me and many other Western Slavists of my generation. We'll be looking at this phenomenon in its broad historical context. We have exciting and very diverse papers, but they will all serve to provide a very broad and also very deep context for our understanding of uh, artist publishers and its role in Russian literary history. Our first speaker, I move on without further ado, is Professor Alexander Dalinin, uh, Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Wisconsin, and I invite him to the podium to speak on the topic of his paper, Profer and Nabokov Revisited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I never met Carl and Ellen Dare Proffer in the Soviet Union of the 70s, but I'm sure that some of, uh, of the artist editions they had smuggled into the country were in my hands. Each time when I came to Moscow, and it happened five or six times a year, I visited Lev Zinovich Kopilev and Raisa Davidovna Arlova, who trusted me and then provided me with forbidden Samizdat and Tamizdat books that they wanted me to read. Many of them were, of course, artist editions. In 1976 and 1977, Raisa Davidovna found out that I was indifferent to Nabokov. By that time, I had read only Speak Memory in Russian, Drugi Biriga, and Lalita in English, but to be honest with you, was unable to appreciate Nabokov's novel, Masterpiece, because of my, what language teachers call, language proficiency. And I started to feed me, they started to feed me with the back of books. First, the CIA Paris editions of Defense and Invitation to a Beheading. Then, artist editions of Glory and Dar. And at last, my favorite, the pink Russian artist Lolita. Raisa Davidovna also gave me Karl Proffer's amusing and witty Keys to Lolita, recommending to read it concurrently, as I now found from her letters she had done herself seven years earlier. And I, 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 I did it. I enjoyed the book immensely. I reread the Keys to Lolita many times and later used it as a major source for my own commentary to Russian Lolita. And I think that Karl Proffer's contribution to Nabokov studies is somewhat underrated. True, it was overshadowed by much more systematic and thorough annotated Lolita uh, by Alfred Appel, who actually acknowledged Karl's priority. He writes in the introduction, I quote, two enchanted hunters working independently of each other, Mr. Proffer and I arrived at many similar identifications. And accepting those which are really apparent, I have tried to indicate where he anticipated me. Well, Brian Boyd, in his uh, uh, seminal biography of Vladimir Nabokov, compares Proffer's academic work to that of his arch rival, his arch enemy, Andrew Field, whom, whose scholarship he calls disastrously careless, and said that Proffer's, Proffer's academic work, by contrast, was breezy, unpretentious, and avowedly provisional. Of course, it's a compliment, but again, with, 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 with this compliment is, in my view, is not enough. It's not exactly fair because I don't know if Karl Proffer would ever admit that his keys to Lolita was a provisional work. He claimed in the foreword that the book was not an interpretation of Lolita. It's true, but still defined it as a very serious exe exegetical exercise, I quote, in close reading, proffered, <laughs> 
Please note the verb. <laughs> proffered uh, uh, as an introduction to the realms hidden in the box of secretly sliding panels and double bottom drawers. And in my view, it's indeed an excellent introduction to Nabokov's poetics. Karl Proffer examines the three pillars on which Nabokov's fictional world stands. First, intensive intertextuality. Without Google and other internet search engines, Karl Proffer identified scores of literary allusions in Lolita. Edgar Poe, Joyce, Mary May, Pushkin, Robert Browning, Rimbaud, Verlaine, Mitterlink, and many, many others. When he, what's interesting is when, when he can't find a subtext or a source, he honestly says so, and therefore invites the reader to join him in this exciting paper chase, in this hunt, and to try to add to his rich trove. Well, and now it, it's actually easy to do. Well, thus looking for traces of Lolita's abductor in 300 hotel registration books, Humbert Humbert is puzzled by the name Johnny Randall Ramble Ohio. And he, he, he broods, was he a real person who just happened to write a hand similar to N. S. A Aristov, Katagela, New York. And Karl Proffer ingeniously cracks the puzzle of Katagela and Mr. Aristov. Katagela is the punning comic name of a non existent city in Aristophanes Arconians, from the verb meaning to smear, to smirk. So N. N S. Aristov is Aristophanes, of course. But, 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 but doesn't have a certain answer to Johnny Randall from a higher. It's a hard one, he writes, honestly again. Perhaps it refers to Sam Johnson, the Rambler, or the bawdy ballad Lord Randall. Nabokov himself would be of no help. Actually, Nabokov deceived Alfred Appel, another annotator of Lalita I mentioned above telling him that Johnny Randall was a real person. He was not. <laughs> now, with Google Books search, we can easily, in actually two minutes, solve this riddle. And Karl Proffer was very close to the correct solution. Nabokov does allude to a ballad, but not in English, an American ballad, and a tragic rather than a bawdy one. In the ballad, a dying man, he was poisoned, either by his lover or his rival, addresses his mother. The boy's name in the main version of the ballad is Johnny Randall. But in a higher, according to American folklore scholars of 1920s, it's Johnny Ramble. So Nabokov refers simultaneously to the two versions of the ballad. Okay, so Proffer was on the right track but he, he just couldn't do it without, without Google. <laughs> second second, second, second uh, pillar is this art of patterning. And in the second chapter of the book, entitled In Quest of Quimby, Quicks Quilty, Karl Proffer writes, like some of Nabokov's other novels, Lolita is in part a detective story. Nabokov includes and conceals his clues with more than skill of an Ag Agatha Christie or Morris Leblanc. And uh, Nabokov, we all know now, does, after Proffer, of course, does play with conventions of who done it. The central mystery concerns strategies and stratagems of the narrator and the narrative itself, rather than the identity of a murderer. Tracing the trail of numerous clues cunningly implanted into the story, Karl Proffer reconstructed and described the whole pattern of kints and knots indicating the identity of Humbert Humbert's fiend and double Claire Quilty. Then third pillar would be Nabokov's famous involuted style, 
visual imagery and sound play, and this part of the book abounds with astute observations of Nabokov's idiosyncratic devices and rhetorical figures. Actually, a couple of years ago, two, two, two Russian, Russian enthusiasts translated Karl Proffer's Keys to Lolita into Russian. And it's a very, very good and funny book in Russian, too. <laughs> and they had to find the equivalents. They couldn't translate it properly because all the examples were taken from the Russian original, and the book of, well, uh, 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 changed a lot in his own translation. And so they picked up, well, equivalents in the Russian translation of Lolita. And they have different lists and different examples, but they sound as good as in English. So it was a real achievement. Uh, beside discussing the book of poetics, Karl Proffer provided a detailed and very helpful chronology of Lolita, indicating some intriguing discrepancies of dates. Among them, there is a tantalizing problem of 56 days that according to Humbert Humbert's statement in the very end, in the finale of the novel, it took him to write his memoir in the asylum and in jail. Actually, Karl Proffer was the first to notice that there are not 56 days between September 25th, the day of Humbert's arrest, and November 16th, the day of his death. Right? So, uh, since, even after reading Keys to Lolita twice, Nabokov didn't correct this messy timekeeping, uh, either in his Russian translation of the novel, or in his final annotated version prepared by Appel, several scholars, me included, came to a conclusion that it was not a mistake, but Nabokov's deliberate plan a clue undermining the veracity of Humbert's story. If Humbert's timekeeping is correct, not erroneous, it might mean, in my view, that all the events uh, in the novel after September 21st, 1952, in, uh, 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 when actually Humbert receives a letter from Lolita, uh, everything this letter, his visiting Lolita later, killing Claire Quilty, and getting arrested happen only in his mind, in his imagination, or in other words, are fictitious. Some number of scholars disagree with this reading, but uh, the, the discrepancy is still not resolved. And the controversy itself and very interesting discussion that followed actually were triggered, uh, triggered by Karl Proffer's wonderful observation of this, of this puzzle. Uh, as you probably noticed, Karl Proffer, from the quotes, of course, uh, Karl Proffer liked to play Nabokovian games himself. For example, in his acknowledgments, there is Professor Marc V. Boldino, <laughs> Uh, that is a jocular semi-anagram of Nabokov's name. And Nabokov, when he noticed in the book, wrote on the margins of his copy the incompletely anagramat uh, anagrammatized name of the person, thanks for his expert suggestions, should have been yours truly, Vivian Bloodmark. <laughs> so he corrected the anagram. <laughs> well, there are many other examples. In the long list of authors alluded to in Lolita, from Olcott, Louisa May, number one, to Verlaine, Paul, and Virgil, 63, name 63, 63 names all in all, there is Poquelin, Jean-Baptiste. And it takes some effort and time to realize that this is the real name of Molière. <laughs> and, uh, of course, in the famous end note to, to, to the book, number 30, there is a fake quote of Finnegan's Wake, actually a good parody of his style, that begins thus. Then flame bird, lindy, so tigris likely, creep kissed, and so on and so on. Lindy, of course, is uh, 
reference to Ellen Day, present here. Uh, the addressee, the addressee, the main addressee of Proffer's games and wordplay was, I think, Nabokov himself. And his book can be read as a dialogue with the author whom Proffer loves and respects, but in contrast the majority of Nabokovians refuses to venerate as a godlike genius. Well, let me give you an example. Discussing well-concealed patterns in Lolita, Proffer writes, quote, as Gershenzon suggested in his analysis of Pushkin's station master, it's like the picture game of childhood where the puzzle is to pick out the tiger hiding in the foliage. It's difficult to find the tiger, but once you do find it, you wonder how it was you didn't see it before. You can't forget the tiger after that. Well, those who know Nabokov probably remember that Nabokov has a similar and much better known image that concludes his autobiography, Speak Memory, Conclusive Evidence, Drugi Birigai in Russian. I quote, it was most satisfying to make out among the jumbled angles of roofs and walls a splendid ship's funnel showing from behind the clothes line as something in a scrambled picture. Find what the sailor has hidden that the finer cannot unsee once it has been seen. There is can, no, can be no doubt that Proffer knew speak memory very well. In his book, he references it more than 25 times. Yet, he prefers to use the practically unknown phrase of Gershenzon rather than its often quoted counterpart. Why? I think that this allusion to Gershenzon is in fact addressed to Nabokov. Proffer seems to imply that he identified the source of Nabokov's famous image, famous quote, actually stolen by Nabokov from Gershenzon and he catches him red-handed. So it's a private, private, private response to Nabokov's image. Uh, well, Proffer actually found a mistake, a rare achievement, a mistake in Nabokov's commentary to Yevgeny Onegin. I wrote to him about it, discussing Pushkin's unsuccessfully quoting Anyata Lenin Nabokov erroneously asserted that the English nickname Red Rover Annette had given to her hapless suitor referred to an obscure play, Wild Oats or The Strolling Gentleman, 1791, by John O'Keefe, in which a character assumes the name of Jack Rover. In fact, as Proffer established, the nickname alluded to the protagonist of Finnemore Cooper's eponymous novel, Red Rover, who exactly like Pushkin, was a person of, I quote Cooper now, slight stature with exceeding agility and even vigor. Nabokov accepted the correction of the error, acknowledging Proffer in the foreword to the second edition of his commentary. <coughs> Actually, in this dialogue with Nabokov, Proffer could, 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 could stand his ground as nobody else. He was the only one. Thus, well, Proffer argued in his keys to Lolita that Charlotte's twice repeated phrase in broken French addressed to Lolita, ne m'entre pas vos jambes, nor did it Bruce of notorious one line poem, or Zakroy Svei Bledne Nogi, or cover thy pepe legs. In a letter, Nabokov disagreed. I quote, uh, the illusion to Valery Brusov is nonsense. Yet in the final version of the book, uh, Proffer just slightly rephrased, rephrased uh, the, 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 this annotation. He begins it like that, maybe it's nonsense, but. <laughs> and this, so again, he replies directly to Novakov. Uh, after reading, and Nabokov respected that, 
And he appreciated uh, 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 Proffer's contribution and Proffer, Proffer's insightful findings. After reading the manuscript of Kiza to Lalita, Nabokov made only 10 corrections and additions. After reading and praising, I quote, the elegant book, he called Proffer a fellow glossarist, corrected just one error and several misprints, and added some interesting, important information for future use as a kind of a gift, a bonus. He actually didn't like, he didn't like in Proffer's book one remark, and a very important one. He didn't like Proffer's, Proffer's point. Proffer argued that Nabokov is too crafty in his writings. He thinks too much, I quote, and therefore he can be analyzed, which is one of his strengths, but also, Proffer argued, an ultimate weakness. However, Nabokov's response to this critique was measured and noble. He writes, a considerable part of what Mr. Nabokov thinks has been thought up by his critics and commentators, including Mr. Proffer, for whose thinking he is not responsible. Many of the delightful combinations and clues, though quite acceptable, never entered my head or are the result of an author's intuition and inspiration, not calculation and craft. Otherwise, why bother at all in your case as well as mine? And it sounds not only as a reproach, but a kind of a disavowal of the authorial total control of the text, so unusual for Nabokov, who would publicly declare himself the perfect dictator in, his wor in the world of his fiction, responsible for everything in it, for its stability and truth. In the letter of Proffer, I quoted, however, Nabokov recognizes that the intention of the text trumps the intentions of the author. And therefore, the ideal reader can find in his text many delightful combinations and clues that the author had never consciously intended. In fact, it's a compliment to Proffer's insightful readings that surprised the author, but who can't help but accepting them, uh, finding them delightful. It reminds me of a famous story about Akhmatova, who was asked of the image of a suicide standing between the wall and the cupboard, Mezhru Stjanka Ishkafem, in the poem Without a Hero. Uh, she was asked if it came from the famous scene of Kirillov's suicide in The Demons, where Kirillov stands with his revolver, with his gun, between the wall in the dark corner, between the wall and the cupboard. Ahmadova was absolutely stunned by this parallel. But then, after thinking, she, 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 she said, I had never thought about it, but I happily endorse it. <laughs> so that's exactly what Nabokov did. He, he, he was stunned by Proffer's observations and discoveries, and he found them delightful. He endorsed them. Well, and I think, it's Proffer's insightful readings of Lolita, his integrity as a scholar and a man, and his dedication to Russian literature and culture that earned him Nabokov's respect and friendship. During the last 10 years of Nabokov's life, Karl and Elendea Proffer became not only publishers of his Russian writings, but also trusted advisors, so to say ambassadors, advising him on all things Soviet. They actually made him realize that not everybody in the USSR was, to quote his unpublished poem about the Soviet Union, an unthinking read, and that he has quite a few good readers there. They even persuaded him to sign a letter in defense of Vladimir Maramzin, a writer and an editor of Brodsky, some as that collective works, was put on trial in Leningrad. <coughs> Unfortunately, Maramzin publicly denounced his anti-Soviet activities, 
and was pardoned by the authorities. So Nabokov never repeated uh, this act of political activism after that. It turned out to be futile. On the other hand, the proffers did a lot to introduce Nabokov into the Russian literary discourse of the late 60s and 1970s. Thanks to them and the editions of Nabokov, such writers as Yuri Trifonov, Andrei Bitov, Vasily Aksyonov, Venishka and Viktor Yerofeyev discovered Nabokov and would fall under his spell like characters in Claire Quilty's play about enchanted hunters. Prof. Reis Nabokov became a part and parcel, important part and parcel of Soviet literature. But this is, I guess, a subject of other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dalinin. Um, I'd like to welcome those of you who came in after the beginning of this workshop and briefly remind you of the format for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at the, um, at the program. There will be four short papers of 20 minutes each, followed by brief discussions from our two discussants, followed by a question and answer session. Let me remind you all again that virtually all the microphones in this auditorium are live, so anything that you say in the audience will probably be transmitted to the World Wide Web immediately. There will be no break in this session, but if you do wish to help yourself to the refreshments at the back of the room, you should feel, of course, free to do so whenever you wish. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Denise Kazlov, who is Associate Professor of Russian History at Dalhousie University across the border, and he is talking today on the subject at the twilight of the thaw, Soviet literature and society during the late 1960s. Professor Kazlov, the floor is yours. Well, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in um, this workshop. Uh, strictly speaking, my work does not focus on artists. Um, what I study, rather, is the world of legitimate literary publications in the Soviet Union during the Thaw years, which immediately preceded the foundation of Ardis, and the interaction between literature uh, and its Soviet readers. Uh, and in this way, the paper nicely dovetails into the concluding sentences of Professor Delinian's paper. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about um, now. My hope is thereby to trace mechanisms and effects of intellectual change in Soviet society. Uh, that said, it was precisely the situation in the legitimate literary world that forced so much of Russian literature uh, into the underground. Um, in this paper, I provide a few glimpses of that literary landscape as it looked by the late 1960s, the time when the proffers traveled, to the Soviet Union, uh, the contemporary climate in literature uh, certainly had an impact on the foundation and the activities of artists. Um, much of my discussion will concern the area of my expertise, the developments in and around the journal Novy Mir. With Khrushchev's removal from power in uh, October 1964, uh, the thaw was not yet over. Its lasting effects would continue to um, impact society and culture uh, long beyond the 1960s. Uh, the Brezhnev leadership also was famously slow in um, reimposing ideological um, orthodoxy, at least until the invasion of Czechoslovakia. And yet, although there was no clear-cut chronological break uh, that marked the end of the thaw, authors and editors increasingly felt the pressure of uh, censorship, and ideological reorientation began um, as well. The years between 1965 and 1970 may be called the time of anniversaries, uh, the moment when the new leadership uh, launched a series of large-scale festivities uh, commemorating the milestones of the Soviet past. Here came the 20th anniversary of victory, the 50th anniversary of the revolution, the 50th anniversary of the Soviet army, and the 100th anniversary of Lenin's birth, to name a few. Uh, reversing the recent denunciations of the Stalin past, the celebrations were meant to reaffirm the regime's historical legitimacy. Uh, history was to be celebrated as a succession of victories rather than revisited as a source of disturbing collective memories. 
Accordingly, around 1966, mentions of state violence under Stalin nearly disappeared from the media. Against this background, the critical stance toward the past, manifested first of all by Novi Mir and Twardovsky, became especially unwelcome. Attacks on the journal grew increasingly frequent and intense. Uh, and in this environment, everyone, including authors, editors, and their watchful audiences, uh, closely followed new developments in literary life, uh, sensitive to the broader political changes they pretended. One such development was the sinyavsky daniel affair, of course, of 1965-66, which for many observers marked the advent of new repressive policies in intellectual life, as well as the beginnings of the dissident movement. The affair was monitored by the country's highest authorities, um, including Brezhnev himself, informing them about popular responses to the affair. Uh, the KGB, in its reports, drew a picture of unanimity and loyalty. However, the actual readers' opinions um, were divided and complex. Letters condemning Sinyavsky and Daniel did exist, but the emotional investment uh, is more frequently visible in the uh, quite many letters of support and defense. Uh, compared, say, to reactions uh, uh, to the Pasternak affair in 1958, that was something new. Um, another new element uh, in the defense arguments was the language of legality, democracy, and human rights as well as the frequency with which references to those issues overlapped with references to the terror. Generally, during the thaw, this emphasis on legality became very common. Uh, democracy and legality, no matter how vaguely defined, came to be perceived as safeguards against a resumption of massive state violence. Uh, in this regard, Soviet society actually paralleled contemporary developments in several Western countries, for example, West Germany and France, where after the Second World War, new attention to legal procedure also originated in a widespread perception that distortions of law had been a major root of 20th century tragedies. Another parallel with the West was the prominence of literature in drawing pub public attention to the tragic past. Uh, in 1966, importantly, it was the Soviet audience itself who set those agendas, concerns about the terror uh, that so many letter writers expressed were not a reaction against any contemporary media script. And so something must have changed by 1966 that now compelled people to write about democracy and legality in such direct conjunction with the issue of mass repression. Arguably, the change consisted in the broad and fairly open um, polemic about the terror that had taken place legitimately in and around Soviet literature and the press in the early 1960s. Uh, during the Pasternak affair, for instance, despite the recent secret speech and the widespread knowledge about repression, open discussions of it uh, had lagged far behind kitchen table conversations. Uh, relatively few people at that time would explicitly identify themselves as victims. But in the 60s, the details of 20th century violence, uh, newly and legitimately available from literature, uh, had an impact on the reader's historical and political reasoning. People began to draw the lineage of the Soviet order from 1937, as much as, if not more than, from 1917. The legitimacy of reading about the terror in their own country made them raise questions about the legitimacy of the country itself. Uh, the growing weight of the terror's legacy also led to a gradual redefinition of social membership. Uh, uniform standards of inclusion and exclusion, such as, for instance, loyalty to the revolution had been before, now became increasingly muddled. Uh, no uniform criteria of social membership could any longer provide binding and reassurance. And it may be that the 60s were the point at which many people actually abandoned the search for such criteria. Instead of exclusionary rallying points and battle cries, more and more readers' letters conveyed an aversion to political violence and a desire to avoid it in the future. The evidence is and always will be insufficient for measuring how widespread those ideas were in society. Impressionistically, it appears that they characterized mostly the intelligentsia and not all of it by far. However, the impact of the intelligentsia in the 1960s should not be underestimated. Uh, this was a large and fast-growing class of educated professionals inseparable from the rest of society 
first of all, and also what matters are not so much fixed numbers in this case as tendencies and long-term impact. And from this viewpoint, the new ideas were symptomatic because in the long run, they would affect increasingly many people. Um, it would be inaccurate, though, to presume uh, that the opinions of contemporary Soviet readers were unequivocally on the side of dissenting writers or unambiguously pro-Western. Uh, many people admitted the author's entitlement to publish in the West, but few celebrated the act itself. Instead of applause, what we mostly see in those archival materials is called detachment verging on dislike. Uh, what perhaps explains it is that the readers retained a very strong sense of belonging to the agendas of Soviet culture. And one of those agendas was the traditional apprehension of things Western. Many continued to display the old besieged fortress mentality, uh, perceiving contacts with foreigners as at worst subversive or at best extraordinary. Uncomfortable was the fact that technically speaking, the West remained a hostile camp. And readers often identified publishing abroad with Western political interests. And while admitting that the author might have not wished for that, they nonetheless presumed that the opposing camp would exploit his text to its advantage. So images of foes abroad dissipated more slowly than specters of enemies at home. This lack of sympathy for literary dissenters publishing in the West offers a correction to some descriptions of the Thor era Soviet intelligentsia where reformism uncontroversially accompanies westernization. The flawlessly consistent image of a reformist and western-oriented Shestidisetnik might be little but an ideal type, as mythical and ephemeral as its antithesis, the inveterate Stalinist, nativist, and counter-reformist. Still, however, I would argue that in the final tally, domestic concerns prevailed. Aversion, um, aversion to a potential return of the terror overshadowed antipathy toward any dealings with the West. And the images of enemies might not be gone, but readers were anxious never to see them materialize in another purge. Despite the sinyavsky daniel trial and other ominous symptoms, the cultural policies of the early Brezhnev period, as I said, remained relatively mild. But things began changing with the invasion of Czechoslovakia in August of 1968. The invasion also led to an ethical and political polarization among the intelligentsia. Some began distancing ever more from the regime in their eyes compromised beyond repair, while others adopted a conservative and statist position, entrenching themselves behind a variety of nationalistic theories. Uh, the question of where you stand was becoming increasingly pertinent during those years. And the final years of the decade became thus the last stand for the Thor line in literature, with pressure on it growing from many directions. And again, it was Novimir who felt the pressure uh, most of all. Uh, what complicated the situation was that uh, uh, the journal, in this journal in particular, now had to fight not only against its usual and familiar rivals, but also against a new force, the authors who professed the ideas of Russian nationalism. Uh, Novimir treated the nationalists with a great deal of skepticism and I would venture to say undue sarcasm and condescension. The sarcastic points were well taken and yet Twardovsky's team might have missed something important. Crude as it was, the Russian neo-nationalistic literature of the late 60s portended the revival of a powerful and aggressive <laughs> ideology which had potential to become a major political force. So what the Novimir team was facing was the rise of a secular religion and it is not obvious that they realized its significance. Uh, that said, of course, there was little they could have done beyond what they actually did, as they had to operate in the framework of the established Soviet reasoning, much of which they shared, too. Be it as it may, the old and the new opponents of the journal eagerly joined forces. In 1969, Novimir came under attack simultaneously for its critical stance toward the Soviet past, um, especially in this case, industrialization. This was a reaction to the uh, book it published, uh, Nikolai Voronov's Youth in Zelyaznadolsk, and for its skepticism toward the nationalists. In this campaign, the opponents of the journal followed a very old media blueprint, or rather a set of blueprints, uh, from the 1920s and 1930s that relied on a serviceable image of the audience, especially that of a simple-minded yet loyal and conscientious worker 
However, responses, the actual responses from the audience, show that the media blueprint had stopped working. The 1969 campaign brought one of the most intense reactions from readers uh, in Novomir's history. Even in these adverse circumstances, most of the letters were fully signed and contained a re uh, return address. Um, as usual, responses from the intelligentsia prevailed, but more than a quarter of the letters came from workers, and not a single worker actually supported the campaign. Instead, they sided with Novomir, and especially noted heavy editorial interferences in the attempts to present criticism of the journal as coming from the working class. The workers themselves were offended by what they saw as the newspaper's cynical confidence in their blindness and naivety. Uh, the tragedies of the past, in this case rather grim memories of industrialization accompanied by terror, continued to preoccupy them. And they readily drew parallels between the media campaigns of 1969 and of 1937. As to Russian nationalism, the letters were full of uh, sarcastic and deprecating comments about the crudity of the new Russophile prose. This skeptical view by the readers casts a new light on the well-known phenomenon, the rise of nationalism during those years. The rise was slow, and it faced serious checks with both Soviet internationalism and the uh, humanistic intelligentsia consciousness standing in its way. Overall, in reactions to the 1969 campaign, readers employed the entire arsenal of intellectual weaponry with which the literary polemics of the Thor had armed them. Numerous people displayed a sharply critical stance toward anything emanating from the established authority. They expressed this criticism in words noticeably different from the parlance of newspapers. They were ready to invoke their own life stories to discredit authoritative dicta about the past, and they revealed intimately skeptical knowledge um, of a broad repertoire of Soviet media devices. What marked the Soviet audience in 1969 were experience, disillusionment, and considerable intellectual maturity. Uh, meanwhile, the pressure on uh, Novomir was mounting. These were no longer the Stalin or even the Khrushchev years. Eye-catching involvement of the top echelon of power in literary affairs was no longer on vogue. Everything had to be done by literary officials and with the least possible disturbance of the peace. Uh, the Central Committee took a position above the fray, although it continued, of course, to pull all the strings. Um, in the fall and winter of 1969-1970, uh, plans for a radical reshuffling of Novomir's editorial board <laughs> finally materialized. I described those events um, in the paper at some length, so I will not dwell extensively on them here. But one aspect I'd like to mention here is uh, the frequent involvement of Western media, Western journalists, who extensively commented on the nuances of those literary battles. This involvement was an irritant to the party leaders, although possibly also a check on their repressive action. But it also put the reformists in the Soviet um, camp in an awkward position. Twardovsky, for instance, kept an eye on Western reactions to Soviet political and literary life, and did not necessarily disagree with commentaries by the BBC, for instance, and other Western radio broadcasts. At the same time, these commentaries never guided him in his work, and often, moreover, they created difficulties for him. Twardovsky always sought to work within the existing Soviet political and cultural framework, trying to change the established um, order from within by customary and legitimate methods. Sympathetic as he was to some of the dissidents, a direct association with them uh, contradicted his beliefs. And so did an association with Western opinions, um, convincing as he might have found them. It threatened to delegitimize his journal, um, its re refle uh, reflective and critical stance to make it look oppositional. And that could easily spell the journal's end. So caught between the fires of the Cold War, Novimir found its legitimate platform ever more unstable. Time has passed, and the significance of these literary battles um, is becoming uh, clearer, to a great extent originating in literature. The intellectual transformations of the Thor affected a vast reading audience and left a lasting impact on society. Soviet readers in 1969 were different from themselves a decade and a half earlier. They knew more and they feared less. They were more aware of their past and less confident about the present. They had fewer illusions and treated even the highest authoritative pronouncements 
with a great deal of skepticism. They spoke and wrote in words of their own. Um, and even if borrowing someone else's, they could now choose from a variety of verbal orders. They had greater respect for the value of human opinion, dignity, and life. And they, at least many, were prepared to state their views openly. And perhaps most importantly, there was no longer a single they. Out of a semblance of moral, political, and linguistic uniformity and homogeneity of the Stalin years, there emerged individuals, myriad individuals, willing to express themselves in a great variety of words. Um, one cannot unilaterally ascribe the initiative in those tectonic shifts to writers or to their audiences. It is true that readers reacted to published texts and thus to agendas formulated by authors in the media. And yet the agendas themselves might have originated in larger processes and culture, of which the texts were only a product. The readiness with which Soviet readers responded to those texts suggests that the agendas had ripened long before the writers formulated them. The relationship between literature and society was mutual and dialogical. Literature, of course, was not the only venue of those transformations, but literature occupied, of course, a special place in these people's lives. Traditionally, the central mechanism for coining and exchanging ideas in modern Russia, it retained this role throughout the Soviet years. And never did it become clearer, of course, than two decades later in the 1980s, when the thought agendas were revived, often by the same people who had forged them, and the revival once again took the established cultural forms. Literature again came to the forefront of politics. This, confronting, uh, this continuing sorry, preeminence of literature as the prime mover of ideas in Russia raises a few questions. Uh, in conclusion, how does intellectual change happen in society? What are the mechanisms by which the minds of a great number of people become different over a span of time? Especially, how does this change happen in a relatively closed and restrictive society, one uh, which the Soviet Union remained during and after the thaw? Despite the end of mass violence, the cultural and linguistic diversification, and the new emphasis on the individual. What role does tradition play in this change? And what roles belong to outside influences? Evidence from the 60s suggests that in order for large groups of people to begin thinking differently in such a society, new ideas need to work from within the established culture to take forms acceptable and familiar to the environment where they spread. <coughs> outside contributions to this forging of new ideas need to take the same customary forms as well. Perhaps most of the literary texts that became prominent in the 80s had been written in the 50s and 60s. In the 70s, many of them would travel to the West in manuscript form, from here beginning their way back to the Russian reader, often by the efforts of artists. What set the agendas for this future still were the texts that did get published in the Soviet Union during the thaw, because they began interacting with the vast uh, reading audience at home. Um, the principal theme of those texts was the massive state violence of the 20th century. Although suppressed, the theme would remain the subtext of the entire late Soviet culture, and that is why it would burst out into public circulation with far greater force 20 years after. The tragedies of the 20th century became the defining theme of Russian political consciousness, and thus the thaw provided the framework for society's ethical and ultimately political re-examination of its own foundations. The re-examination continues to this day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kozlov, for your rich and intriguing paper. I congratulate you, moreover, on compressing such a very, very detailed paper into 20 minutes. That was a major achievement on its own. Um,